and welcome to our Sunday morning service. We're glad you joined us this morning. It's a great day to be in church. Amen? Amen. I, I didn't hear enough people. It's a great day to be in church. Amen? Amen. We're going to kick off the Christmas season this morning. Uh, so we're going to sing a song, uh, I Have Seen the Light. a seeker for light in a dark world. I look for truth, but settled for lies. I had been blinded. I couldn't see. Yeah. 
him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We'd like to introduce you to a new song this morning called Sing We the Song of Emmanuel. Sing me the song of the day. 
Father God, thank you again for this day and each and every day that you give us. Bless the service today. Thank you already for the opportunity that you have given to each of us to lift up our voices and to sing unto you and worship you and praise you. You are more than worthy, Lord, of our praise. We pray, Lord, that you do a work in our hearts this morning as we have gathered here today, whether we're here in the building or those that are watching on the live stream. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you just do a work that only you can do. As the word is preached, as the worship service continues, draw men and women, boys and girls, to you. For someone that may be here or someone that may be watching, we pray, Lord, that they've never received Christ as their Savior. We pray that this would be the day that they would be born again into the family of God. But thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for loving us. Bless this day in a great way. Be with those who are maybe away this morning. Watch over them as they travel. Those who are perhaps working, help them to sense your presence at the workplace. Those not feeling well, we pray your healing hand would be placed, Lord, upon each of them. In Jesus' name we ask and pray all of these things. Amen. All right, thanks. You can be seated. Well, good morning. All right, it's good to see you here today. It's just good to sing Christmas music. Did you enjoy that? I love that new song. Usually I know the new songs that Aaron introduces, but I had never sung that until today, and uh, I really enjoyed it. So I imagine we're going to sing it a few times, huh? Four, okay. <laughs> we'll keep singing it until we know it. So sing with the song of Emmanuel. You know that word Emmanuel, uh, most of you probably know what it means. It means God with us, that God has come with us. And um, the scripture that we open with today, that's going to be our theme scripture for the Christmas season, talking about beholding his glory. We beheld his glory. So I'd encourage you to be here for all the services, and I'd encourage you to invite a friend. It's a wonderful time of year uh, to invite someone to come to church with you to experience the real meaning of Christmas. Right? It's a, it's a, it can be a trite expression, but people do understand that there's something behind it. There's meaning. And use the opportunity uh, to spread the gospel. Amen? It's good. All right, just uh, make a quick note of your bulletin today. We've got some things happening. First of all, today, right after the morning service, we have our starting point lunch for uh, new attenders and new members of our church. And if you're new to MGBC or if you've never explored what it would mean to be a part of the, the membership family of our church, this, this lunch is for you. You're welcome to come. And uh, there'll be a complimentary lunch after the service today. And hopefully you can be a part of that. Uh, we're looking forward to it. So that's this morning. And then lots of events coming up for the Christmas season. Our youth and young adults, they have their uh, Christmas party on Saturday night next week. Uh, that'll be at 5 p.m. And then the next day after church, our kids, we're doing a big Christmas party after the service with our junior church age children. And that's uh, our life group, our family life group is coming together. We've been, we've been praying about how can we as uh, the church family have a bigger impact on the boys and girls that ride in on our bus. And so one of the things that we're going to do is have a little party for them after church. And our families and the, and the uh, bus children, their families uh, are all welcome to come to that. So that's going to be next Sunday. And at that point, we're going to rehearse with the kids for the annual Christmas pageant that'll be the following week and all the boys and girls love getting dressed up as shepherds wise men I don't know what all the costumes we have planned for this year but that'll be in two weeks on December the 19th I think we've got some other really special things planned for that service as well so just make a note of all these things um, of course the Christmas Eve candlelight service that service is just a really sacred time we we look at some scriptures we dim the lights in here. We go through scriptures of the Christmas story. We sing Christmas carols, traditional Christmas carols by candlelight. We finish with Silent Night. And so I know that Christmas Eve can be super busy and super hectic, but that six o'clock service, it's just a time for your family to come and really just set apart some sacred time. And we as a church family, um, it's a beautiful service. So I want to encourage you to come. Of course, all of these events are open to the public. We want to invite as many people to come and be a part as, as can be. 
So those are some things that are happening. I hope that you'll get involved. We have our life group schedule also on the other side of the bulletin. So get connected, get involved, and uh, let's keep growing in our faith together. Well, right now we'll take a minute to um, dedicate our offering to the Lord as we do each Sunday. So as, uh, as we prepare, the Bible says that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And we reflect on the greatest gift of all that came through Christ. We're able to reflect our gratitude to him through our giving. So we're going to ask the blessing on the, the tithes and offerings. I'm going to ask Micah Hare, if you would, good and loud, sir, from the back, just ask the Lord to bless our offering today. Father God in heaven, we thank you that we're here today, God. We praise you for who you are, Lord. And we just ask right now that you would bless the, the tithes, God, that, it, that we would be uh, faithful in our giving, God, that we would give back to you. And Lord, that the monies would be used for this community uh, just to share your love and the real meaning of Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand us and join us in singing King of Kings.
Well, good morning again. I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter number 1 this morning. John 1 and verse number 14 will be our theme verse for this Christmas season here. And we'll look at this verse. We'll look at some of the other verses around it. We're going to do a little Old Testament today, a little New Testament. So do you have your Bible ready? You got it? Let me see. You got your Bible? You got All right. Awesome. We're ready to go. We're going to dive in this morning, John 1, verse number 14, and let's read this together. Ready? Let's read it out loud. John 1 and verse number 14, the Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Could you, you notice the parentheses in that verse, that little section that's in parentheses, it says, and we beheld his glory. And we beheld his glory. Well, this morning, the topic is behold his glory. Let's take some time this morning to step back to consider the glory and the wonder and the majesty of Jesus and just behold it. You know, when I say that word, if I were to come up this morning, and it's not, it's not uh, really a common expression. If I walked in and, and I said, behold, you know, you think, boy, something very significant, something very dramatic is about to happen. That's the intention of the word. Say, behold, it means just stop. Just stop for a minute. Just reflect. Just take it all in. So if you're with me this morning, let's do that. Let's just slow it down. Let's stop for a minute, and let's just behold the glory of Jesus this morning. Well, let's ask the Lord to help. We'll pray, and then I'll show you some other scriptures. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you've revealed your glory to us in your word. God, I need your help this morning to preach. I thank you for the, the privilege to open the Bible before uh, this audience, Lord, before this church family, and to uh, explain the scriptures. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to be faithful to that calling. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us as a church to be faithful in our listening to the Word of God today. And, and Lord, I pray that if there's someone here that's, that's never really considered, Jesus, who you are, I pray that through our time in the Word today that it would be clear and that they would receive you as their Savior. I pray all of this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Yes. What well, glory is mentioned in the Christmas story. Let's take a quick look. Now, it begins, the, and we sang this in some of our songs this morning, but the Christmas story begins not in the manger in Bethlehem, but it begins far before that when the prophets were given the word that there was a Messiah coming, there would be a Savior coming. And so the Christmas story begins way back in the Old Testament. I want to show you in the book of Isaiah right now, Isaiah, verse, uh, Isaiah chapter 60, look at verses 1 and 2. This is a prophecy about the coming of Jesus. It says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. And could you read this next statement with me? Ready? And the glory. the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. This is prophesying Jesus. You can read in Matthew chapter number 4 that how this particular prophecy was fulfilled. But it talked about a world in darkness and how light was going to shine in a dark world. And when that light shone in this dark world, it, the, Jesus would be the glory of the Lord. It goes on in verse number 2, that prophecy, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee. Read it with me. Ready? And his glory. And his glory shall be seen upon thee. Now we fast forward 500 years, just outside of Bethlehem, on the hillside. There were, in the same country, what? Some of you know your Christmas story, right? There were in the same country, what? Okay, we were a little more confident that time. It's shepherds, okay? And there were in the same country? Shepherds. shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Did you see that? What, what shone round about them? The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. They were scared to death. 
when they saw the magnificence of the glory of the Lord. Now we skip forward a few verses, down to verse number 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, ready? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So you see it. I hope I've clearly made the case here that this idea of glory is throughout the descriptions of Jesus, his birth, his coming, but it's actually a theme that runs all throughout the scripture. So if I were to ask you this morning, what is the glory of God? We have careful definitions for a lot of things, right? Like faith, for instance. If I were to ask you to d define, give me a definition of faith, some of you might say, well, faith is believing without seeing. Some people may, might say that. Or if I were to say grace, we've got a little acronym that we use in, in Sunday school. Grace is God's righteousness or God's riches at Christ's expense. How many of you heard that before? So we've got these neat little theological definitions. But if I were to ask you to define glory, I don't know how. I, I, I didn't come up with a simple definition of it. I don't know if you have a simple definition of it. But as I looked and studied, I couldn't find a real simple definition. The idea of glory, glory is something not so much explained as it is experienced. It's not so much explained as it is experienced. You could use words to describe glory. You could use words like supreme excellence or radiant splendor. Or let's try awesome magnificence. Those would, be, those would be accurate descriptions. Those would be accurate words to describe what glory is. But I want you to notice here, it says in our key verse, in verse number 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now this is, you got to think of who's writing this. It's the apostle John. The purpose of the book of John is to explain to people who Jesus is. And so at the very beginning, as he wants to tell them that Jesus is the Word, that's the name of Jesus in this text, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. People might stop and scratch their head and say, well, how could God dwell among us? Well, notice what John does. He puts in parentheses, speaking of himself and the other disciples, he says, and by the way, this isn't real because I'm writing about it. It's real because why? Because John says, we beheld it. We saw it. We experienced the glory of Jesus. The supreme excellence, the radiant splendor, the awesome magnificence. As I think of glory, I think of something, I think of something that once you encounter it, you cannot look away. We actually use the word glory in some of our cultural, in some of our cultural narratives, we use the idea of glory. In fact, if you go back to ancient times, people were thought of glorious in battle. How many of you have heard that before? Just like they're going to go out there and they're, they're, they would be glorious in battle. What do they want? They wanted to live for fame and for glory. Just that, so somebody would say, wow, that is amazing. What's another context in which we actually use the idea of glory today? Anybody think of one? I think of the sports arena. Would you not agree that people in the sports arena, they live for glory? I mean, and, and, and some, there are many Christian athletes who live for the glory of God. But when you think about glory on the football field or on the basketball court, I grew up watching Michael Jordan play basketball. That was my childhood. Michael Jordan, now, nowadays I know it was Kobe Bryant. All the kids came up watching him. But listen, there is, I don't think that's an incorrect word to use. When you watch an athlete make a tremendous play or do something amazing, you just, you want to see what? If you watched it on the football field, you watched it on the basketball court, nowadays with our mod modern technology, you say, show me the, show me the replay. Show me the replay. And you'll watch it. It's like, whoa. And you just, glory, as I think of glory, I just, the, the thing that stood out to me is glory is something that when you see it, you cannot look away. I think greater than all of that, though, is the glory of nature. 
How many outdoorsy people in here? I mean, you kind of got to be if you live in this part of the country, or at least you should be an outdoorsy person. People ask, well, what's it like to live in the Berkshires? Well, if you like shopping malls and strip malls and, you know, lots and lots of restaurants, probably not the place for you. But if you like trees and mountains and all kinds of different weather, this is the place to live. So embrace it, right? And sometimes I, I, I have a job, and most of you know I'll work uh, out in the Springfield area, and we'll drive up over Florida Mountain, and we'll come to that eastern, that eastern summit. At Depending on the time of the year, sometimes my drive is right when the sun is coming up. And it is. You take that drive sometimes. There's no other word to describe that sunrise, but it's glorious. And you just want to look at it. You just want to see it again. And then you take out your phone and you snap a picture and you look at the picture and you're like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just, you can't do it. The, the most glorious natural experience that I ever had as far as nature goes, about 14 years ago, almost 15 years ago, um, I had the opportunity to go to Switzerland. Anybody seen the Alps before? Anybody been able to do that? Now, most of you, you, you know that Deborah, she grew, she grew up, she was born in Switzerland, so she still has a lot of family over there. And we landed, and I, we were, you know, 22 years old we, on a trip, and I was just my first experience. We landed, and, you know, just a lot of jet lag and all that. I hadn't gone overseas a lot, so that jet lag experience was new. So I just remember being exhausted when I got there. And we go into these little villages, you know, we sat down and we had a, uh, a cup of coffee and some, um, uh, some croissants. I didn't know that you pay for every croissant you eat. I didn't know that. I learned that lesson, though, because I just kept, you know, chowing them down. And, um, but we're in these, these little villages. They're cute. They're neat. They're, you know, they, they have something really cool about it. Nothing glorious, but definitely really cool. And then we, um, we, we drove to some of her relatives' house, um, and they didn't live in like a majestic region, and it was a little bit of cloud cover. So, you know, th this is a neat experience. Well, we were scheduled the next day to take the train through a mountain pass up to the region known as Sermat. Now, you can look that up later sometime, but we got there, again, cloudy day, and it's nighttime when we get there. So... So far, this has been cool, but, you know, it's all right. So we went to bed that night. You know, jet lag, just wiped out, go to bed. The next morning was a crystal clear day. I woke up with the sun shining in. I walked to the window, and this is what I saw. Right? Now, again, it was more like this. It was more like looking at the camera, and you're like, yeah, it's just not capturing it. That is the Matterhorn. And everywhere you would go, we get on a train, we, go, we went skiing there, we went up on the hill, and then there's, a, there's some other views of it, and, and you'd see it everywhere. And everywhere you went, you just couldn't stop looking at it. Is this there? That might be a similar experience. I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but that might be an experience at a place like that where you just say there is no word to describe it but awesome or our word glory. There's the glory. Why does God give us these things? Why do we see this? Because all of these natural experiences, everything we've been through from human accomplishment and achievement to the glory and beauty of nature, they are simply reflections of the ultimate, awesome majesty and glory of God. So if you're coming today and you're hoping, you know, like, you just for a little, like, you know, be kind at Christmas, here's three things to, to help you have a good Christmas, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the awesome glory and power of God, because he is for whom we were created, to know him and to be known by him. He is glorious. When we encounter glory, we cannot look away. Now with that in mind, look back at our theme verse in John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. His glory. Everything about Jesus was glorious. 
Wouldn't you have liked to meet him in Galilee or in Jerusalem? Wouldn't have you liked to, the things that you read about in the, story, in the gospel narratives, wouldn't you have liked to have been there and to have experienced him in that physical sense? We will someday if we know him. There's something about them. John says, we just, from the very beginning, I mean, after all, John was fishing with his, with his brother James. And this guy said, leave all your nets and follow me. And there's something about the glory of Jesus that John said, okay, sounds like a good idea. I'll walk away from my whole life and I'll follow you with everything. Why? Because he's glorious. He's glorious. I would encourage you, if you are someone who's a little bit skeptical about Christianity, before you study all the principles and the theology and the dogmas and all of that, before you study any of that, just take a look at Jesus. Read the Gospel of John. Read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and look at who Jesus was. Because John says, we beheld his glory. To fully understand the glory, and I'm going to give you, there's just two main points this morning with the time that we have left. What you had in the Old Testament, there's probably two characters who are the most well-known Old Testament characters. One I would probably say is Abraham, and maybe the other would be Moses. Everybody knows, everybody, uh, at least in this last century in America, knows who Moses is. We have Charlton Heston to thank for that. But um, if you're under, I don't know, a certain age, you have no clue what I'm talking about there. But anyhow, Moses is probably the most, one of the most, if not the most well-known of all Old Testament Bible characters. The law came through Moses. The Ten Commandments were given by Moses. I want to show you these two things here with the time we have left. In Moses and in the law, we have a glimpse of the glory of God. It's quite the glimpse, but it's just a glimpse. In Jesus, we behold the glory of God. We see it all. Journey with me back to a very interesting story in Exodus chapter 33. Turn your Bibles, if you have a copy of the scriptures with you this morning, turn back and I want you to see this in Exodus 33. Now I'm going to ask you to stick with me because all of this is going to weave together. Look in Exodus chapter 33. I want you to see Moses' encounter, Moses' encounter with the glory of God in Exodus 33. Now, a little backstory. Moses got the Ten Commandments from God. He went down. The people were acting really foolishly and sinfully. So Moses takes those Ten Commandments, and what does he do with them? Who knows the story? He takes those Ten Commandments, and he... Oh, he smashes them to pieces. Smashes them to pieces. Well, we're picking up the story at round two. Let's replay. Let's try this again. So in Exodus 33, look at verse number 8. And it came to pass, when Moses went out unto the tabernacle, that was the place where the people would worship, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. This is an intense scene. You got to put your mind back there to an arid desert, arid desert in the Sinai Peninsula where the people of God are just this ragtag group of slaves freed from Egypt. They live in tents. There's oh, 600,000 to 2 million people. It's a big group of people and they're all living in these tents. And right in the middle of it all, the tabernacle is positioned where people can see it. And so Moses, who just rebuked the people, smashed the Ten Commandments, he's like, I'm going to meet with God. Pretty intense, right? And so all the people come out of their tents and they watch. They watch what's going to happen. And they watch until the figure, and maybe you're in the back of the crowd, and Moses is just this very small figure walking into that tent, and he disappears behind the tent. And they don't know what happens. They don't know what we're about to read. Moses goes in. Verse number 9, but they see something else. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, a cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. So you're watching. 
You're there with your family. Moses goes in. As soon as the tent flap closes, what comes down? What is it? This pillar, this cylindrical form of cloud comes down, and you're just watching, and you're like, whoa. At least that's what I'm doing. Whoa. By the way, do a little Bible study. The clouds are always indicative of the glory of God. Jesus went up in the clouds. He's returning in the clouds. The cloud hovered over the temple. It's a fascinating Bible study to do it. The glory of God is in this cloud over the, over the tabernacle. Verse 10, and all the people saw the cloudy pillar. All the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshiped every man in his tent door. Good idea. Verse 11, and the Lord, this is amazing. You ready? And the Lord spake unto Moses. What's it say? Face to face. Face to face. Now, this is a figurative expression. You're like, well, how do you know that? Because you're going to see just in just a minute or two, God says, you cannot see my face. So the idea here of face to face is some kind of figurative expression that it wasn't a voice coming down from the clouds. When Moses went in, he is there and God Almighty is right there in some kind of form, in some kind of glory, but a veiled glory. But it says, the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Moses speaks to the Lord. The Lord tells him in verse number 12 that he's found grace in, my, in, in his sight. Now look what it says in verse 13. Moses says, now therefore I pray thee, if I have... If I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And the Lord says to Moses, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And Moses is so thankful. He says, well, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up. I don't even want to go, God. I don't even want to go if you're not going to go with me. For wherein, how will people know? that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight. Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and the people, for all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Now, verse 17, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. God says, I'm going to be with you. I will go with you. I will show all of the nations that you are mine, Moses. And now, verse number 18, Moses says something bold. I mean, he's in the presence of God, and he says something bold, and he said, I beseech thee, what's he say next? Show me thy glory. He says, God, I want to see it. I want to behold it. I want to experience your glory. Now, look at this. This is absolutely fascinating. If God... What might you expect next? Don't read ahead yet. Hang on. What might you expect next? If God says, show, if Moses says, show me your glory and God's going to grant the request, I might expect a lightning bolt, right? Boom. I might expect power, authority, you know, I am righteous. You know, that in our human frame, as we think of the glory of God, that's what we might expect. But look at how God describes his glory. And let this, I hope this is en encourages every heart and soul that hears this this morning. In verse number 19, God says, I will make all my, what's it say? Goodness. Pass before me. He could have said all my power, all my judgment, all my justice. But he says, Moses, you want to see my glory? Let me tell you what you're going to see. You are going to see my goodness. The heart of God towards you and toward me, the glory of God displayed toward you and me, is not wrath, it's not vengeance, it's not primarily justice, it is goodness. He goes on. I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before me. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show 
mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my what? Face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my, where, what's the word? Glory. Passeth by, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Verse number, next chapter, verse number four, so... Moses hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud. Again, symbolic. The cloud is always symbolic of the coming of the glory of the Lord. It says, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name Yahweh or Jehovah. That's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's the Hebrew Jehovah, Yahweh. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, Jehovah, Jehovah God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Did you believe me before when I said the glory of God is his mercy, his goodness? He says it again. He says, you want to see my glory? My name is Jehovah. My name is Yahweh. And I am merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. He goes on. Verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sins and sin. His primary desire is forgiveness. But lest we forget, he's also God of justice. But it's interesting that he leads with the goodness of God. In fact, there's a verse in Romans that, say, that says it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Because he, he goes on, he says, I'm going to show thousands iniquity and transgression, but I will visit the iniquity, I'll visit the iniquity, um, I lost my place. There it is. Of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and to the fourth generation. Unto the third and the fourth. You'll notice that the, I, you'll just have to take my word for it on this one. I don't have time to explain it. But the, the, in verse number seven, the grammar, the structure is this. Just like it says the fourth generation, um, you see that's, a, if you're reading in the King James, that's a supplied word there. The fourth is linked with thousands in verse number seven. The grammar is the same. I'm going to show thousands my mercy, and I'll visit iniquity to the third and fourth. You see the contrast there? I'll show, I'll show, I'll show, I want to show mercy to thousands. I am a God of justice, but my desire is to show mercy and goodness. That's the glory of the Lord. Now, one last thing that happens. Skip down to verse number 28. Look down at verse 28. Moses experienced this glimpse of the glory of God. Verse 28, and he was there with the Lord, how long? Forty days and nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. So this is a miraculous encounter. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. It came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses was not aware, he wist not, he was not aware that what? Moses. What? What are you looking at? Moses. What, what, are, you, what are you looking at? And somebody picks up a, maybe a crude mirror, a looking glass of the day, and they show him the looking glass, and he doesn't even see his face in the looking glass, but what does he see? Just this glow of light. His face is miraculously shining. Why? Because he had been in the presence of the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. And do you know what Moses would have to do? You can read about it. Moses, somebody was like, here, put this on. And he grabs that veil and he puts a veil over his face. And when he would go in for the people... Follow me now. 
Moses would enter in for the people and speak to God face to face. And when he would come out, he would do what? Put the veil back on. And so all that, could you imagine what that would be? This guy, like with this cloth over his head, I just see the light shining through it, you know? It, I, I, you know? I have a bit of a childish imagination sometimes, you know, this guy going around with a lit up head all the time. I don't, I don't know, that might be a little uh, off track here. But the idea is he's just, people would see that. Remember what Moses asked for? He said, God, give me some proof. God, give me some evidence of your glory. I want people to know that I am yours. I want people to know that we are yours. And every time they would see Moses, they would get a veiled covering of the glory of God. They would see a glimpse of the glory of God because Moses had been with God and the glory radiated from him. But I want you to think about this. Jesus is glory embodied. Beautiful truth of the Christmas story. Remember our theme verse? And the word was made what? Flesh. When people looked at Moses, they saw a glimpse through the veil. The Bible speaks of the veil of the body of Jesus. That when Jesus took on human form, that was the veil through which you and I could experience the glory of God. Theologians have written about this. In fact, songwriters have written about it. But first, the scripture, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, speaking of Jesus, Colossians 2, 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, how? Bodily. When you look at the, when, when they would look at the physical body of Jesus, John said, we were beholding his glory. In the body of Jesus, we saw his glory. One of my favorite Christmas hymns, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Think about the words here. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ, the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come. Offspring of a virgin's womb. Look at the next line from this beautiful poetry. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Jesus Christ is glory embodied. Can we understand something very important this morning? When we, to be a true Christian, to be a true believer, is, it's, it's not primarily about, and, and please don't misunderstand me, I'm not diminishing the importance of any of these things. But the point isn't that we behold a body of doctrine. The point isn't that we behold a system of beliefs. The point isn't that we behold an organized church. The point is this, a true Christian is someone who beholds the glory of Jesus, of who he is. That's what we're called to, to look to Christ, to see him. Jesus in the flesh, everything he did, the, the, everything he did was to reveal the Father to us. In fact, John 1, 18, I've given you this scripture. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath what? You see, you still with me? We're coming, we're coming to a conclusion here, but stick with me. The only begotten of the Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath what? Declared him. He hath declared him. Anybody ever wonder why is Jesus called the Word? Why is he called the Word? That verse explains it. Because in his body, he declares, he speaks the Word and says, this is God. I am, Jesus was eternally one with the Father, but he comes to be made like you and me so that we can look at Jesus. You want to see God? Thomas would say, Lord, show us. Some of you know this passage. Thomas, the disciple, he would say, Lord, show us the... Father, show us the Father. Jesus says, Thomas, have I been with you all this time and you don't understand? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus is what I like to call the declaration of the divine. You read the Gospels, and I encourage you to do that this Christmas season. Read every time he spoke, it is the word of God. Every time he showed compassion or healed it is the action of God revealed to us 
Jesus is glory. And Jesus is the glory of the goodness of God. In the same chapter, John chapter 1, back at verse number 17, I told you this all comes together. Verse 17, for the law was given by... Do we have that verse? I just want to make sure everybody's able to see it. John 1, 17. It says, for the law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by what? By who, I should say, Jesus Christ. Leave that verse up because this is where we're going to, this is what we're going to talk about as we conclude this morning. Law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. People saw the glory of God when they looked at Moses, but they only saw a glimpse of it. And they got the law from Moses, and they only saw part of it. But when Jesus came, we received God's grace, his truth, and his glory in all of its fullness. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. But the sad thing is this. There are still, Christ there are still people who claim to be Christians who live under the, the law. They don't understand that everything you need is in Jesus. There are, there are whole churches, there are whole denominations, and they do, they do one thing, they try to take people and put them back under the what? Under the, under the, the law. They try to put people back under the law and say, you want to be right with God? You want to experience God's glory and blessing in your life? Well, you must do this. Follow this commandment. Follow this teaching. Obey this. Do this ritual. Find all of these, these religious expressions that are a legalistic bondage. You can't see Jesus Christ through the law, ultimately. Or you can't receive grace through the law. Jesus fulfilled the law, and he gives us his grace. And he gives us his truth. There's no grace without Jesus. There's no understanding ultimate truth without Jesus. It is all about him. So I said there's, there's really... Two people that two groups of people that struggle with this. There's very religious people, very religious people who say, No, I've got to prove God is so glorious and I've got to prove my love for him by the things that I do. And Jesus says, You could never prove it. You could never do enough. You can't fulfill the law. I've come to do that for you. Just receive my grace, behold my glory. That's what it's called. That's why the Bible calls that being born again being saved, when you realize that he is glorious, I am sinful, but Jesus made a way for me to receive his glory and his grace. So you could be a person in here that you struggle with that. You're, you're trying to please God through the law. You need to behold Jesus alone this morning. There's a second group of people, though, that are Christian people. They, they've come to that realization in their life where they say, you know what? Yes, I am saved entirely by grace, but their Christian life becomes more focused on their performance than living in the glory of who Jesus is. They reduce their Christian experience to, well, I'm a Christian, so I, uh, I don't do this and I don't do that. I, I obey all the rules and that makes me a good Christian. Our ultimate, ex our ultimate calling as believers is to experience the fullness of Jesus and then let his grace transform our lives. So as you enter the Christmas season, very simply put this morning, take time, take a spiritual moment to behold him in all of his glory. Behold his glory and receive his grace. Would you bow in prayer with me? It's a, it's a quiet time, but an important time. I want us each to think about to think about the scripture that we just studied together. Let me ask this question first. Are you someone are you someone who is trusting in your religious performance? Are you trusting in yourself? Are you trusting in in your own abilities or maybe in a church or in a family? Are you trusting in anything but Jesus? He is everything. It's Jesus plus nothing. Have you come to that point in your life where you understood, oh, it's not Jesus plus me. 
It's only Jesus. If, that, if you've never come to that point in your life, you need to be saved. You can be religious, but, but not truly saved. You say, well, well, Ethan, what do I do? Right now, receive Christ. Whether you're in this room or you're watching the video today, it's not about who you are, it's about who he was. Would you receive Jesus today? You say, what do I need to do? Just believe in your heart. But sometimes it helps to express it in a prayer. In, in a prayer like this, you could say something like this, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I can't earn my salvation, but I do believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose again, and I put my faith and trust in you and you alone. Tell Jesus right now, my trust is in you and you alone. If you receive Christ today, if you put your faith in Christ today, I'd ask you to let me know. Either speak with me after the service or um, send a message on, on Facebook or an email. Just let us know that today I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. We'd like to pray for you that you could grow and grow in grace. Christian, how about us now? What can each of us take away from the message? I don't know how God spoke to your heart, but it, let's have a quiet moment of prayer where we just surrender our thoughts, our hearts to the grace and the goodness and the glory of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are, for how you've revealed yourself to us in the word and in the person of Jesus. I pray that we would walk out of here today just a little bit different, a little bit more in awe of your wonder and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Stand and join us this week.
starting point lunch this morning. Just give us about 15 minutes to uh, get everything ready and we'll end the service time here. Um, and then we'll enjoy that time together. But God is good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's, uh, let's pray. And I'm going to ask Ken if you would dismiss us in prayer. Today we come to worship you. Lord, it's been a great day. Many day in the Lord is a great day. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the music. Thank you for the preaching, the good preaching. And Lord, uh, we just ask that you be with us as we go home. And, Lord, help us uh, to live out what we've heard, to think about what we've heard today and uh, throughout the week, even, until we meet again on Wednesday night. Love you, Lord. We just thank you for your grace and mercy in our life, your great grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So glad that you've taken the time to join us today. If you've been blessed by the message, if you have placed your faith in Jesus today, we want to hear from you. Maybe you still have questions about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Please let us know, and we would love to answer those questions from the Bible. We would also be happy to provide you with the Bible and other free Christian resources to help you grow in your faith. You can email us at info at mountgraylockbaptist.com. Or send us a message on Facebook. You can also call us at 413-662-2107. We would love to hear from you, and our desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that we can. God bless you.